the first years of the NBA, the former NBL teams dominated. The players were the best and their teams were the best. But at the NBA's, if there, we could call it a business plan, their plan was to show how big league they were. And Oshkosh and Fort Wayne didn't look like something you want to brag about as big league. Welcome to Good Seats Still Available, a curious little podcast devoted to exploring what used to be in professional sports. Here's your host, Tim Hanlon. Hey, everybody. How are you? Thank you for coming back to visit our little podcast. We call it Good Seats Still Available, a curious little podcast that is devoted to what used to be in professional sports and uh, in a world that's uh, seemingly gone kablooey and haywire and all kinds of craziness out there. Uh, hopefully a little comfort food uh, for you in the realm of uh, sports history and uh, nostalgia uh, as we uh, wend our way through uh, stories and uh, teams and leagues that uh, for whatever reason don't exist anymore and our little uh, journeys into investigating why and how and perhaps little stories that uh, that are uh, frankly a little too early uh, uh, forgotten, easily forgotten, and um, and we seek to uh, shine some light on them and remember them and perhaps even unearth uh, some new tidbits that were not known before. We thank you for coming back. If this is a return visit for you and if it's your first time in our little uh, journey together, uh, we appreciate you giving us a try and uh, we hope we uh, entertain you for the next uh, hour and change. Today's guest is our uh, old pal Murray Nelson, uh, our second return visitor. Uh, we previously chatted with Murray uh, in an earlier episode about the American Basketball League and uh, the role of Abe Saperstein. Uh, in that league, uh, he being of the management of uh, the uh, world famous Harlem Globetrotters back in the day, uh, and uh, very interesting conversation. We encourage you to go back into the into the vaults to uh, to find that uh, episode with Murray. But today uh, we're talking about uh, the National Basketball League, uh, which uh, is a very important topic for any professional basketball fan. Uh, in today's modern day NBA and uh, the recognition that the NBL, the National Basketball League, uh, which was around 1937 to 1949 or so, uh, which merged in 1949 uh, with uh, the then fledgling three year old uh, Basketball Association of America or BAA. Uh, it is the merger of those two leagues, the NBL and the BAA, uh, that netted no pun, perhaps pun. Uh, the uh, modern day or the beginnings of the modern day National Basketball Association, uh, which launched from it. Uh, the NBL, very interesting uh, stories and um, uh, and the little tidbits, uh, you know, not the least of which was uh, a largely Midwestern uh, league and industrial uh, roots uh, teams uh, that uh, were comprised of workers from uh, companies big and small, including things places like Goodyear and, and Firestone and General Electric, uh, who would uh, proverbially work by day and play the game of uh, professional basketball uh, by night and weekends uh, all across the Midwest. Uh, a bit of uh, exposure, uh, not only in cities like uh, Chicago and uh, Minneapolis and Detroit and Cleveland, big cities you would imagine, but also small little hamlets that uh, – that uh, uniquely uh, made up uh, some of the quality players and 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 play of the NBL places like Sheboygan, Wisconsin, uh, the Tri Cities uh, in Iowa, Waterloo, Iowa, uh, Anderson, Indiana, Hammond, Indiana, uh, uh, the uh, the probably the the basketball mecca in 1937, 1938, Akron, Ohio, where the Firestone and Goodyear teams were located. Um, just uh, an amazing uh, array of uh, of of cities, big and small. Uh, and the players uh, that comprise the National Basketball League. Uh, we're going to get into that uh, that topic, the history of uh, the uh, the legacies, plural, of the NBL, uh, the uh, uh, dozens, a couple of dozen of uh, uh, all-star uh, players that are part of now the uh, Naismith Professional Basketball Hall of Fame, uh, and, and frankly, five uh, franchises that exist in today's NBA with direct ties uh, to the origins uh, of those franchises in the NBL. And those in particular are, uh, if you're a fan of the Los Angeles Lakers, the Sacramento Kings, the Detroit Pistons, the Atlanta Hawks, and of course, the Philadelphia 76ers. All of those modern day teams uh, directly root themselves uh, in the early days, the beginnings of the National Basketball League. Our topic uh, in this conversation with Murray Nelson coming up in a couple of seconds. Uh, again, we are sponsored by our friends at Audible. 
the uh, audiobook company that uh, it just continues to amaze. Uh, we've had a few folks from uh, our uh, previous episodes give Audible a try through our little website here, audibletrial.com slash goodseats. And they have enjoyed, as you can too, a free audiobook download for uh, your enjoyment, uh, as well as uh, 30 days of uh, the free trial of the Audible audiobook service. Uh, you will find over 180,000 titles uh, to choose from in lots and lots and lots of different genres and, and topics. Uh, the Audible titles play on just about every device that you can think of. And uh, it's uh, it's a great way to uh, pass the time uh, when you're not listening to your favorite podcast, of course. Uh, that's audibletrial.com slash goodseats. Uh, you will get your free 30-day trial of the Audible service as well as a free audiobook download to uh, enjoy. You can cancel at any time. Give it a try. Uh, again, a number of our friends, our listeners have given it a shot, and um, we hope you will uh, do the same. And uh, I, I guarantee that you will enjoy uh, listening to audiobooks courtesy of our friends at Audible. We appreciate Audible for their sponsorship of the show. And um, that's really cool, right? Sure, of course. All right. So our promotional stuff uh, out of the way. Let's uh, not waste any more moments uh, and get right to our conversation with, again, uh, our return visitor, Murray Nelson, and our discussion about the uh, the NBL, the National Basketball League of the late 30s and uh, most of the 1940s, coming up right here on the show. I'll be honest, our second repeat uh, customer here on the uh, on the big show. And uh, obviously, we had a very uh, uh, compelling and, and fun conversation when uh, we talked about the old ABL and, and Abe Saperstein. But uh, there's no doubt that the, um, uh, the, the beginnings of pro basketball, uh, as we know it today, actually started certainly much earlier. And uh, one of your other works is about the National Basket League, which was uh, a very important and oft forgotten uh, tributary to what is today's uh, National Basketball Association. So uh, let, before we sort of get there, uh, remind our audience uh, your professional background and how you uh, skated into the, um, the world of, of basketball and basketball history in, in particular. Well, I'm a professor emeritus of education and American studies. And one of the foci that I've often had and always had actually since I was in junior high has been basketball history and in that vein I was I've been teaching a course or I have taught a course on the rise of the American sport hero between the wars which used one of my books my first basketball book which was the one on the original Celtics which I was very interested in because I wanted to read a book on the original Celtics, and there wasn't any, so I ended up doing the research and writing that. In the context of that, I kept overlapping with other players who had been on that team who had become NBA or college coaches and kept bumping into more on the National Basketball League and, again, was uh, interested in that. But that was about it. But what really infuriated me was when the NBA declared its 50th anniversary in 1996 and completely ignored that the NBL had existed. And I was so irritated by that that I, I wrote a letter to Sports Illustrated because they had bought into this and said that this was simply not true. Either you accept that the NBL was uh, one of, if not the forerunners of the NBA, or you pretended that the NBL didn't exist because that, that just didn't make sense that it could be ignored. And the letter was, was seen by a guy named Dick Tripto, who had played at DePaul and been George Mikan's roommate when they had been at DePaul. And then they had played together in the NBL later for the Chicago Gears that won an NBL title uh, the Chicago Gears did not exist for very long, uh, but uh, Dick wrote to me and said how much he enjoyed the letter and introduced himself, and we got friendly, first by mail and then by phone, and then eventually meeting each other and becoming what I considered, I was honored to be a, a good friend to, to Dick, and 
that set me off on being interested in, in researching more on the NBL and being able to talk to some of these guys who were still alive at that time. In many cases, they would have been harder to find, if not impossible, if not for Dick's intrusion, because he, he knew men, many, if not all of them. And of course, talking to Mikan, who was hard to find and wasn't really into interviewing at that point, um, he would he would talk to me because of Dick. So uh, almost all of my interviews that I had in the NBL book, which were great fun for me, were set up by Dick Tripto. And then Dick's materials, Dick had written uh, a book on the Chicago Gears that uh, came out after my NBL book that he had used so much of his own material. And when I went to his house, and he lived in Lake Forest, uh, and I was happy to do that because I was originally, I went to high school in Deerfield, and then would we played against Lake Forest, and uh, and he had coached. So it was really fun when I occasionally go back to Chicago to be able to go and visit Dick, and and that just got me going, and I started doing the research, and the research would involve both some of the great interviews that Dick would set up for me, and I'd do them with him and with me and with my staff assistant and whomever it was that we were interviewing. And I saw Dick's materials at his house, and then I suggested that he accompany me on one of my trips to archives in Sheboygan and in Oshkosh. And we had a great time. I got to go through all these materials and spend more time with Dick. So that was really how I got interested, and that was how the, the book got going. It was all from uh, the NBA being semi-ignorant, if not just totally exclusive and forgetting about the existence of the NBL as one of its co-founders. All right. So a couple of hints there that we'll, uh, we're we going to get to in the course of our conversation. One of them, of course, being uh, the importance uh, and significance of the Midwest in not only the NBL's uh, creation and evolution, but uh, but obviously what became of uh, ultimately the um, the tributary into the NBA as well. And you mentioned a couple of towns. We're going to get to that in a couple of seconds. Um, but first, so uh, this is interesting because you're I think you're basically saying is that you had uh, uh, quite a few uh, 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 access points to uh, original source material via direct interviews with some of these. Uh, players and actors, uh, so to speak, in the NBL's existence, yes? Yes, uh, and I think probably, uh, unless they've lived to be over 100, I think probably every guy that I interviewed has now passed away, and I got some some uh, interaction by letters with a few people. I had uh, uh, some correspondence with John Wooden, who also played in the NBL, and, and of course, John is is gone also, but his letter his letters to me were were, were very gracious and useful. So uh, yes, this was indeed something that was able to be done because of or a- able to be done as well because of the interviews with these people who were uh, who were engaged and could describe the venues and the kind of play they had. It was. Uh, it was enlightening and fun for me. Well, so let's let's get into so how the NBL sort of became uh, uh, the NBL. Um, obviously, like a lot of uh, leagues and, and situations, uh, there was some uh, prelude, shall we say, about uh, the situation around, uh, let's call it professional basketball. Maybe it wasn't even that uh, prior to the NBL coming into existence. You want to give our audience a bit of a sense of sort of the primordial ooze, I guess, by which uh, the NBL effectively got uh, uh, started? Well, uh, the NBL was uh, originally, if we want to connect that as original, was was the Midwest Conference uh, starting in 1935. The Midwest Conference was a professional league that was the, the top professional league. And there were little professional leagues all over the East and the Midwest. Um, most of them weren't much. But there were really two hubs for professional basketball in the 1930s and the 20s, and that would have been the Midwest and the Northeast. And most players who were playing 
had other jobs. It was hard to make a whole lot of money playing professional basketball, but they did, and the games were scheduled such that one could hold a real nine-to-five job and play basketball probably two or three nights a week. Since the leagues were regional, they would be able to get back to work the next day because the travel wasn't terribly far. And the, the train system that we had in the United States at that time was actually very good. You could count on the train getting you to someplace and back. And most of the players, uh, the teams didn't travel generally as teams. They traveled individually and they would hook up wherever it was. And so that the, it was important to be able to know the train schedule. So most of the players had them memorized. And starting in about 1935, uh, the Midwest Conference began with uh, players who wanted to continue to play ball, mostly because they loved to play ball and they wanted to play against the best competition, and because there were some, uh, shall we call them benefactors, uh, people who owned small businesses who enjoyed basketball, good basketball, and also saw that there was a a way to, to kind of do some advertising for their own small business so they could sponsor the teams, their names would be on uniforms, and their names would be in the programs, and that would be something that everybody could enjoy, both the, the we'd call them the owners and the players, though they didn't own very much. They had to get rights to use various venues. What they owned was the equipment, and a contract with independent contractors, players, who sometimes were also able to uh, to play in, on their own independently, although not for another team in the league. So that was in the, the, the 30s, and 35 started with the Mid- Midwest Conference with a number of teams that were sponsored by grocers or, in, in the case of Akron, um, there were two companies, Firestone and Goodyear, uh, the tire companies, each of whom uh, were sponsors of a, of, a, of a team. And these teams were playing independently, and they ended up talking. That is, the owners' sponsors ended up talking and saying, let's put a league together. And they, and they did that. It was loosely done. There was no minimum number of games that had to be played against other opponents in the league. Uh, they, they didn't have a, uh, it, we would call it today an unbalanced schedule. And then ultimately, there would either be a championship at the end of the year or they just see you had the best record and call that champion. And some of those teams ended up uh, playing in, in ultimately what was a, a world championship later on. But that existed for two years. And then that teams fell apart. That is, the sponsors couldn't keep it up or didn't wish to, and some did. And and then the, there was kind of a, a melding into what would be a new league that was really built out of the Midwest Conference, and that was ultimately called the National Basketball League starting in 1937. And the, the league itself signed the top players, and those players, as I said, had other jobs. Many were coaches. Uh, many played in... Uh, uh, would would coach or would be working at regular jobs. John Wooden was the scoring champion uh, and of the Midwest Conference, and he was coaching in high school at the time. So that was a a, a pretty familiar story. And the the league ended up starting in '37 and moved from anywhere from six teams to eight teams to four teams to up and down for the next 12 years. Well, a couple of things here, right? We we uh, we talked a little bit about some of this when um, uh, we were talking about the ABL, uh, even in the early 1960s, right? So the the industrialness, shall we say, or the uh, the yeah. really tight uh, connection between industry and companies and uh, and and firms, et cetera, and their sponsorship, and then some uh, around the sport of basketball, including the players and and giving them essentially day jobs while they were able to to play their night jobs of basketball uh, was very, very strong. Yeah. I think maybe perhaps more pronounced uh, almost than any other sport around that era where, um, you know, working and playing basketball were so neatly tied. But what I'm also interested in, too, is that um, I think uh, 
you know, as the league gets started, there were three particular companies that uh, seemed to make an imprint. Uh, and I'm curious as to maybe why. Perhaps you know, perhaps you don't. And that's GE, General Electric, Firestone, and Goodyear, which essentially, I think, became kind of sort of the the ultimate, um, I guess, uh, corporate sponsors and foundation uh, for this league in 1937. Well, it, there would be two two reasons. One was was just because the some executives liked basketball, uh, and they they wanted to have closer contact with basketball. And we we can't fully understand that today since we have television, internet, we have uh, basketball leagues and teams playing all the time. But once you were finished with college, there wasn't as much basketball going on. And some of these executives still really had a, a hankering for the sport. And they had an opportunity to uh, to get their own teams together. It's it's kind of like fantasy league today, where you can get into a league and you can have players playing for you. Well, this is kind of a, a realistic version of fantasy, or a fantastic version of reality, whatever you want to call it. And uh, the the people who are in charge, or in charge of management, or certain areas of these these companies, convinced the company generally that this was a good thing. It got people out playing. It also kept uh, their employees both attending and employees who work for them healthy. And it encouraged, and at least in, in Akron and Firestone and Goodyear, they had set up gyms and facilities for their employees. They wanted to keep them healthy. And they were far ahead of the curve in knowing that if you kept your employees healthy, then they didn't lose sick days. So you had them working. So uh, employees were, were generally using the facilities, and what they did is they, they hired guys who, most of the NBL players, again, were, were different in that they had attended college. This was um, new, so that they were employing people who had attended college. Uh, a number of them did not, but there were lots of jobs for people who didn't attend college, who had some some ability to do something in the factories. And these were big industrial factories. So that was in, in their benefit in terms of the overall picture of getting them to stay at work, that is the players and the, the, the people who were from the company who would go out and support them. And it gave them advertising. So it was, it was a good reason for them. And they had the, they had the facilities there so they didn't have to search those out, at least in those companies. And and it seemed to work. You know, that's interesting. You know, it almost it almost feels like it's uh, it was an, an extension almost of sort of the uh, uh, the morale or, or, or uh, college spirit of, of the collegiate ranks. Right. But only extended into into the world of, uh, of professional companies and corporations. Right. Where the you know employees can feel good about the company and, and their participation and becomes more of a lifestyle extension than it is sort of a, a second job, if you will. Indeed, indeed, that is exactly the the analogy you can draw. Uh, there, that these people, especially for some who might not have gone to college, and even those that did, they they were able to identify with their company and with their players, and it it uh, built in loyalty. It probably was a good way to keep people working and wanting to work for the company, and it gave them an outlet to uh, to be able to go and see good sport if they're interested in sport because this was the best basketball that was being played in the country so uh, it sounds to me that some of the uh informality i guess of uh of what you described in the midwest league uh, uh, uh blended over into uh the beginnings of the nbl and tell me if i have this right so uh, it seemed that uh I, from what i can tell the scheduling uh, of the games at least in the early year or two or three i guess uh was more at the discretion of each individual team um, there was, a, a, I guess, an attempt to uh, put some level of minimum games uh, played so that there could be, a, e- even if it's still an unbalanced schedule, it would still be something along the lines where at least players, uh, teams were playing at least 10 uh, games or so or a certain amount on the road. Uh, and interestingly, I think, and again, tell me if I have this right or wrong, uh, there's, uh, from what I can tell, there was a choice uh, uh, based on the home team's preference of how the game was actually going to be even played, right? Was it going to be 10, sorry, 10-minute uh, quarters of four of them, four 10-minute quarters, or 
uh, interestingly, three 15-minute periods. Uh, do you want to sort of delve into some of those uh, dynamics of how games might have even been played in those first years or two? Well, it was, as you say. Uh, I, I've noted that they, they wanted to, to be loose enough so that there was some flexibility, but firm enough so that there would at least be seen as uh, some equitability, that each team would not be, or that all of the teams were playing on, on the, basically the same footing. But some teams liked the three 15 minute quarters, uh, and, uh, or that we would call them three 15 minute periods. And uh, for whatever reason, sometimes it was because the, uh, the fans preferred that, they were used to that. The game was not at that time uh, totally solid in, in the way it was divided. So there was a, a continual dynamic at that time, 15 minute quarter, the three periods or the, the two, four periods of 10 minutes each. And we saw that carry over actually into m- more modern basketball with the way men's and women's games were played up until recently that, uh, it would be, there were different rules and, and different ways of, uh, of timing the game. And it's because when Naismith originally invented it, it was dynamic. Uh, there were, there were always changes going on. It, it developed. We've, we've seen over the, you know, the short life, relatively speaking of, of basketball uh, over the last 120 years that there have been a lot of changes that would have made the game difficult to recognize if you had been around in 1900. The game is, is different, but there's a lot of stuff that you'd say, oh yeah, I see the basics. I mean, the, just the development of dribbling and how much you dribble, the development of the equipment and how much you would want to dribble with a, a ball that really didn't dribble very well. And the, uh, the baskets themselves and the play itself. Uh, so, so there was a, a lot of dynamism in basketball at that time, which some people could say made for uncertainty, but the positives would be that it was, it was always exciting and getting to see the game develop. So the, uh, the, the teams and the, the league was, the, the executives were smart enough to see that they wanted to retain that. They didn't want to become calcified so quickly. All right, so let's talk about that first sort of season or so. Um, you uh, made reference to one of the teams that uh, clearly established its dom- dominance uh, in the earliest years of the NBL, uh, that being the Oshkosh All-Stars. Um, do you want to give some sense of sort of uh, the types of teams that are in this league at this time and perhaps why uh, Oshkosh, uh, that major gigantic metropolis uh, in the Midwest, would uh, rise to being such a... Uh, I guess, a dominant and, uh, and forceful team uh, in the league's uh, early uh, year or two? Well, they were fortunate in Oshkosh and every team. There was no draft, so you would be seeking out players and uh, consider the, the 1930s and the way you would find players. You would know them because they went to college or you would know them because they didn't go to college and they were local, and most teams we're trying to find players that would have local appeal. So again, not just the people from their, their own company, but the people in the region would want to go and see somebody play because they knew them. Uh, they appreciated basketball, but they appreciated even more when they, they knew somebody. Uh, Oshkosh had, uh, had players who were, had some local contact, uh, usually working there, the, the two top players, and, and I advocate this in, in my book on the NBL and continue to, to advocate it, that the two top players uh, who have been uh, screwed, as it were, who have been uh, just ignored for the Basketball Hall of Fame, uh, Leroy Edwards and Charlie Shipp, were, were dynamite players. And Edwards had gone for a year at the University of Kentucky. And he had been one of their top players, but apparently he wasn't that good a student. And the times were such that it was hard to maintain yourself in college when you had very little money. So players weren't going to college if they, they weren't able to afford it. There was, there was not a basketball scholarship that was going to be given out. Uh, the early years of the NCAA were such that they didn't sanction 
or deal with any of this. So Edwards left. He was working, and he went to work in Oshkosh and play in Oshkosh. And Charlie Ship uh, was from the region, and he was uh, uh, probably the best defensive player, as well as a good offensive player, but the best defensive player uh, in the league. And he came from uh, that region of Wisconsin. And once they both ended up there with the rest of the team, they played a, a tough game. Now, the game, of course, was much different. Big players were anybody who was over 6'3". Uh, Edwards was the all-star center for any number of years in a row at 6'4", or 6'4 and a half. He was left-handed. He also led the league in nicknames because uh, he was... We always we always love that nicknames. Well, give, give us a few. I know I know one was well, Cowboy. Cowboy and Lefty were his his two. Uh, I, I don't want to say his favorites, but those those were the most common. Then others had to do with his his mountain background and uh, his Kentucky background. But he was a he was a rough player. George Mikan told me that he was the roughest guy he ever played against. He never said dirty, but he said he was. He was just like a tree. Now, I remember that Mikan was 6'9 or 6'10 and was, was built pretty well also. And, and uh, Edwards was 6'4 and a half. And uh, George said that he just, you couldn't move him. When you went for a rebound, he was immovable. And he had a great hook. Uh, he, he could hook right-handed, but he was, his left-handed hook was almost unstoppable. And this is with Mikan saying that when he had six inches on the guy, or five inches at least. So Edwards was, was tough. He was quicker than you would think. Uh, he had a nice shot, and he, he led the league in scoring a, a number of years, and he was uh, the first-team All-Star player for at least five years, and he was on the All-Star team, either first to second team, for almost every year that he was in the league. There's also another uh, thing that uh, that Leroy Cowboy Evans uh, or Lefty, have, uh, however you choose to, to re- remember him, um, was responsible for uh, that ultimately uh, endured in the in the game and in the rule book. And that was the uh, the three second rule. Do you want to maybe give a little bit of a sense of? Well, that was the, the same of- thing that, that, that Mike and said that he was immovable. Once he got in there, if he posted low and they got him the ball, he was going to score because he was wide enough and quick enough that he would be able to score uh, either with his left or his right hand. And there, there had to be something done. The, the league figured to, to make it fairer. So they, they said you couldn't just camp in the lane and they ended up making the three second rule, which was basically called initially the Edwards rule because of, of Leroy and, Obviously, it got picked up by other places, and then ultimately it has become uh, a, a rule everywhere. Uh, the lanes may change, you know, the Olympic lane being uh, uh, not a straight lane, but, but uh, curved li- or lines that go at an angle, but it's still the same rule. Guys can't camp in there, and if he was allowed to camp in there, if he missed, he'd get the rebound too. So uh, they, they had to do something about it without – taking it out on him personally and that seemed to be the the best notion so uh let's uh uh, get a bit into why perhaps uh somebody uh so uh uh, dominant and remembered as such uh was or is or still has not been uh brought up uh and inducted into the uh the basketball hall of fame is it because perhaps and maybe we'll talk a little bit about this a little later on uh, the NBL has been, uh, I want to say whitewashed, but essentially uh, kind of uh, de-emphasized in sort of as, as one of the tributaries to what is today the NBA and the quality of play? Uh, absolutely. There, there are two major reasons, and they're interrelated. One is there's nobody around who's, who's on these committees, what are called old-timers committees now, who are old-timer enough to remember guys that played in the 30s and 40s. And so that play itself has been ignored. And the feeling is that anybody who was good uh, has already been 
named for the Hall of Fame, the only exception being those players that might have been discriminated against because they were from uh, African-American teams. And of course, the the Wrens and the Globetrotters have been put in as a team, so they didn't have to single out players. But again, that was late coming. Uh, and the other reason, and the biggest reason, is as, as you've noted, that the NBA was, a, was formed initially in 1946 when the BAA, which had the best venues and was in the big cities, combined with the NBL, which had the best players and was in smaller cities. And in fact, the NBL was uh, really a source of pride and for small town America. But the BAA seemed to be uh, better off financially. And they, in the, uh, the merger, uh, both leagues had all of their teams combined into the NBA. And that was initially 17 teams, which seemed a lot at the time. It doesn't today, but at that time, uh, it was quite a bit because there were uh, eight and 10 teams. One team didn't make it, and that left 17 teams. But gradually over time, the NBL teams, the old NBL teams, could not keep up financially. Uh, they were, it was too difficult. They, they, couldn't make, they couldn't pay as much because they were in smaller cities. And as travel became more difficult, because the railroads also started to decline too, and also it was farther. The NBL was in the Midwest, and the BAA was almost exclusively in the Northeast, where things were closer and the cities were bigger. And over time, the demands, financial demands, were not such that the NBL teams and the NBL owners could maintain themselves. And the BAA as, uh, and the new NBA wanted to look like a real major league, which meant the, the top cities. And the top cities were not Oshkosh and Sheboygan and Fort Wayne and Toledo and the rest of the NBL. So they kind of, as you use the term whitewash, they kind of just pushed that aside and, and said that uh, that was a different league. Uh, the NBA starts with the BAA and they go back to the, to the years of the BAA, 46, rather than the, the, uh, the merger in 49. And so those, those early NBL years and even some of the merger years were, were looked down upon, even though the first years of the NBA, the, N, the former NBL teams dominated. The players were the best and their teams were the best. But it, uh, the NBA's, if there, we could call it a business plan, their plan was to show how big league they were. And Oshkosh and Fort Wayne didn't look like something you want to brag about as big league. Yeah, I think that's really interesting because uh, you, you're, we're talking circa 1937 when the NBL uh, launched and the, uh, the BAA uh, did not launch until 1946, as you mentioned. Uh, yeah, there were some big cities, obviously the Minneapolis's and Chicago's of the world, right? But Waterloo, Iowa and the Tri-Cities and Kankakee, Illinois, Hammond, uh, Indiana and Whiting. Uh, you had uh, Flint. You had Anderson, Indiana, Richmond, Indiana. Uh, you know, these are just... Uh, Akron, right, which actually uh, seemed to be almost uh, in the earliest uh, couple of years of the NBL, probably seemed to be almost like Basketball City USA because you had both mm-hmm. of the Firestone uh, and Goodyear teams uh, and, and, and uh, marketing geniuses uh, uh, naming both of them, the Firestone non-skids and the Goodyear wingfoots, right? They were uh, perennially the first couple of years uh, quite good. I'm sure the rivalry was very strong, but here it was happening in the uh, relatively smaller uh, metropolis of of Akron, Ohio, versus say a place like Cleveland or Detroit or even uh, uh, Syracuse or even Rochester, which are far bigger, or Buffalo. Yes, and uh, and those teams were were even bigger, relatively speaking. Those cities uh, were bigger, relatively speaking, then than they are today. Like Rochester, really was a more important city, and I'm not trying to demean Rochester, but it just doesn't have the same cachet that it did in the 1940s. So uh, it it didn't look as far as the, the people who were involved leading the league, and they were from Boston and New York, uh, for the most part, they didn't want to be associated or seem to be associated with such uh, 
uh, podunk towns. And so they chose not to be, and they just kind of uh, revised their own history. Well, let's talk about a bit of those sort of podunk towns, because frankly, a lot of those uh, smaller uh, uh, places, right, were... Uh, not only some of where the best, some of the best basketball was coming from, but frankly, some of the more ingenious uh, owners and uh, and visionaries. Uh, one in particular being uh, somebody who would actually uh, be quite uh, prominent in keeping the uh, the NBA when it was uh, uh, merged and evolved from uh, in the years down the road. And that was Fred Zollner, the owner of the aptly named Fort Wayne Zollner Pistons. Um, and, uh, perhaps maybe that's a good time to start talking about his, uh, role in all of this as the league sort of went through its first couple of years, as well as his team's, uh, role in, uh, in, uh, in significantly, uh, winning a bunch of things and, uh, and some of the players that uh, were brought to bear from it. Well, Zollner joined, uh, the Zollner Pistons were not, uh, an original team in the, uh, NBL, but they joined fairly quickly. Uh, and there's a really good book, which was helpful for me. Uh, the, the, the Zollner Pistons were, as I said earlier, um, his factory, his company, the Zollner Piston Company, uh, believed in the same thing that I talked about earlier, that they wanted to have uh, healthy facilities and healthy players. So they had teams and they had facilities right on their campus, as it were, and they had uh, great baseball teams and great basketball teams. And uh, the person who was in charge of all that, Roger Nelson, uh, did write a book called The Zollner Piston Story, which details a lot of this. And uh, Fred Zollner loved sports and wanted to see the league succeed once his team joined. Now, most of the, the teams or many of the teams really were, were barnstorming teams initially. And if they weren't, they did barnstorm even when the league was in, uh, in, was in season. Uh, the, the number of league games would vary from, oh, 24 to 40, but there was time for, for barnstorming, particularly within the, uh, the Midwest where you could be away and you'd be supported by your company in order to do that. Uh, Fred Zollner recognized that and he supported it. And when his team, uh, came into the, came into the league in the early 1940s, 1941, when they were doing tremendous business, that is the Pistons were, because this was, uh, the onset of war. And then during the war, they were extremely busy doing, uh, all of the piston work for, uh, World War II for, for airplanes and tanks and jeeps, so uh, the Zollner Piston Company was was doing great, and he wanted the league to succeed. And there was a short time when the league could not have enough teams, and that would have been uh, during the, the mid '40s. And he basically supported the entire league. Uh, it was it was necessary. Because 1941-42, there were only uh, five teams, six teams in the league, and half of them couldn't have supported themselves. But he would kick in enough money to keep it going. And it wasn't seen as a conflict of interest. His interest is in the success of the league. And it didn't buy his team a title, I should, I should say, too. It did, they did win the title in... Uh, in 42, 43, when there were only five teams, oh, it ended up being four teams. But he supported the two Wisconsin teams and the Chicago Studebakers, who again were uh, uh, being successful as a factory at that time because of the war. Uh, he was also responsible, or at least his uh, his uh, team management was also responsible for bringing in, perhaps, uh, arguably. Uh, the best or one of the best players in uh, in the league's history and a guy by the name of Bobby McDermott. Um, you want to give a couple of a moments of, of, of why M- McDermott, well, McDermott was so had, important uh, a figure a in the NBL. Setback. He, though, actually making the Hall of Fame. And he did. But he played for a lot of different teams, uh, and he did play in the early years of the NBA. So the NBA claims him. But he started as a, as a kid 
in the NBL when he was 18 or 19 and was a tremendous shooter, was incredibly fast and quick and uh, a tough defender and a good passer. And he was one of the early superstars of the league and played for Fort Wayne and uh, ultimately ended up on the, uh, on the Chicago gears when uh, Mike and came in and that's when they ended up winning the, uh, the NBL title because of, uh, of the success of, of those players. That is, they were led by McDermott and, and, and Mike and, and McDermott could shoot from just about anywhere. Uh, remember we're talking mostly about two handed set shots and with the base that you have, his range was out to th- around 30 feet and uh, he was deadly from there. So it, it spread out the, uh, the defense. And of course, when you have a guy like uh, Mike in inside or any of the other players that would be inside players, and you've got to go out and guard a guy at 30 feet, there are a lot of holes inside. So it meant that his teams are successful and McDermott was a, a great defender to, uh, to prevent other teams from, from doing the same thing on, on, uh, his teams, whichever they were, Fort Wayne, uh, or the, uh, or the gears later. So at 30 feet, that's, that sounds like that's, uh, that's a three point, uh, territory and then some. You can imagine if there was a three point rule, uh, in place then, uh, just what kind of scoring uh, numbers he would have been, uh, been putting up at that era. Oh, indeed. Uh, yeah, he was, uh, he was deadly. And, uh, and Dick, um, uh, talked about how, what a tremendous shooter he was, that in practice he could shoot, uh, 10 in a row from that distance and, and make them and, and would, would laugh about it. Okay, friends, sorry for the interruption. Just wanted to quickly remind you that today's episode of Good Seat Still Available is brought to you by our friends at Audible, the premier provider of digital audiobooks with over 180,000 titles to choose from in just about every genre you could think of. Audible titles play on iPhone, Kindle, Android, and more than 500 devices and MP3 players for listening anytime, anywhere. And for a limited time, my audience can listen to a free download of any book that they choose, as well as get a 30-day free trial when you go to audibletrial.com slash goodseats. That's audibletrial.com slash goodseats. And you can choose from over 180,000 titles, as we said, including uh, one that I'm listening to right now. It's called The Ten Gallon War by John Eisenberg. That's the story of the NFL's Cowboys, the AFL's Texans, and the feud for Dallas's pro football future. Um, another one on my list, which I have yet to download, but is on my queue, uh, that could be interesting to our audience here is called The National Forgotten League by Dan Daly. Entertaining stories and observations from pro football's first 50 years. Those are just two of the many thousands of titles to choose from, and not just in sports history, but you name the genre that uh, you might want to listen to, and Audible's got it. By the way, two uh, two guests, perhaps, that we'll have on the show, hopefully sometime soon. But again, go to audibletrial.com slash goodseats for your free 30-day trial, as well as your free audiobook download to try it out for yourself. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash goodseats. And now, back to our conversation. So uh, a couple of things here of note here, right? So uh, which is a, a sort of a bigger theme here, right? So here's one example, the uh, the Fort Wayne uh, Zollner Pistons, right? Uh, a direct uh, descendant or a direct uh, forebearer, I guess, of what today is known as the Detroit Pistons. And, and I, think it's really, yeah, I think it's really important to understand that the NBL, uh, based on my research, which is far more crack than uh, your more professional version of such, right? But I, based on my uh, uh, my calculations, you've got at least five uh, current NBA franchises that are direct or can be directly uh, uh, attributed to uh, their time uh, in the beginnings of the NBL. That being uh, the Lakers of LA, obviously Minneapolis. We'll talk about them in a few minutes. Uh, the Sacramento Kings, which uh, began their long and, and cursory journey uh, in Rochester as the Royals. Uh, we talked about the Pistons now in Detroit. Um, 
Buffalo, even the Buffalo Bisons and tri- slash Tri-City Blackhawks. There's a merger along the way, which is really now the Atlanta Hawks. And again, we'll talk about them in a few minutes as well. Today's 76ers of Philadelphia uh, beginning their their journey as the Syracuse Nationals. So That's yet, correct. Yet, yeah. yet again, another question around sort of Hall of Fame and or NBA history treatment. Um, you can't deny that these franchises and, and there are obviously others that uh, were part of uh, further amalgams that wound up in the NBA and still are around today, or at least were part of. Uh, it seems really incredulous to me that you could deny uh, a lot of the st- uh, statistics and or uh, contributions that the NBL and some of its franchises and players made, uh, and including Hall of Fame recognition, et cetera. Well, and, and that's exactly right, and it's, and it's infuriating to me when you see the the teams and what they did when the NBL teams became part of the NBA and they basically dominated and then they continue to exist. And when you trace them back, as you just said, you see where they started, which was in the NBL and you see some of the players and uh, the, the abilities they had and, and where they came from and what they became. And some are in the hall of fame, like uh, Bobby McDermott, uh, some other, and, and Mike and Al Servi, who for many years was the, the heart of the Syracuse Nationals, uh, Bob Davies, uh, Red Holtzman played for Rochester, and of course, he's in the Hall of Fame as, as a coach. Uh, Arnie Risen, who played for, for many years, he, he played at Kentucky and then uh, played for, for many years uh, also in the NBA. There's, there's just too much to ignore yet. In, indeed, it's ignored. Uh, one of my favorite pieces of, of, uh, of NBL artifacts is that in, uh, in 1948, uh, the, the BAA uh, had, uh, had cards. Uh, they were uh, Bowman Company, Bowman Gum Company, put out a set of cards in, in 1948 that was from the BAA, but so many of those players uh, also had played in the NBL, and you can see in that that set uh, how important the NBL was. When the merger came, the Lakers moved as a team into uh, the from the NBL before the merger came. The Lakers had moved from the NBL to the BAA. So the year before the merger, the the BAA managed to convince. Uh, the Lakers to move into the BAA. So uh, in terms of their history, the NBA claims, of course, that the, the Lakers were uh, an original NBA franchise, and they were, but only because they'd been in the B- BAA for one year. They had been in the NBL for, uh, for two years before that, and they'd been the Chicago Gears before that. So it's uh, when you get to, you know, the, uh, I guess it was Napoleon who talked about how the winners get to write history. And that's what we see here. Interesting analogy. Um, Don't know if Napoleon himself was a sports fan, but um, he was not a basketball player. (laughs) Probably not, uh, given his, uh, shall we say, challenging stature. Um, So before we sort of move on to the sort of the uh, the 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 last sort of segment or the last era, I guess, of the NBL, and and you've you've hinted at some of those things. I I think there's perhaps more. Uh, th- there's probably no better example of uh, maybe uh, in a microcosm the the NBL uh, and uh, the uh, the small town nature, the small town midwestern nature uh, of some of the teams, and what then became of uh, I guess that dynamic. As not only the BAA came about, uh, but then the uh, the merger and some of the pre-merger uh, NBA merger uh, hopping, shall we say, of teams to the bigger, more uh, seemingly big city professional league of the BAA. And that's the uh, Sheboygan Redskins. And, and for our audience, can you give us a, who don't even know where maybe Sheboygan is, maybe that uh, <laughs> you could give them a, a hint of not only where Sheboygan is, but perhaps why the Sheboygan Redskins uh, perhaps are are well worth noting in, in this uh, bigger tableau of conversation. Well, Sheboygan and, uh, and Oshkosh uh, both, of course, are, are, are in Wisconsin. And Sheboygan had, uh, 
uh, an interest in basketball before the NBL, and they had um, uh, teams, uh, amateur teams, and then uh, a uh, a barnstorming team in Sheboygan. Uh, Sheboygan and Oshkosh, by the way, have, have great archives. The uh, the Sheboygan archives are in- incredibly helpful. They've got uh, photos, and I have some of the photos in my book. And they have uh, they had great artifacts, copies of contracts. I mean, getting to see this stuff and see how much people did or did not get for playing. Uh, Sheboygan was a uh, was a a growing. Uh, Midwestern town in the in the early part of the century, the 20th century, and within the uh, within the fold of the Midwest at that time, the the league fit perfectly for Sheboygan. They could have the traditional rivalry of Oshkosh, which was uh, maybe 75 miles away, and they also had Chicago, and as you mentioned, Kankakee. So the uh, the farthest from Sheboygan that they would go any, anyway would have been probably uh, over to Akron. So when we, we think about distance, uh, Sheboygan also was right on the railroad, uh, which there may be a railroad in Sheboygan today, but it's certainly not a pas- passenger railroad and it doesn't go regularly. So Sheboygan, because of its location, uh, it also was on, right, it's right on the lake also. So it had a lot of shipping. So that Sheboygan was a big, important town in the upper Midwest and was able to attract a lot of companies. And, of course, the companies then could attract um, a lot of basketball players if they, had, uh, if they needed to have jobs. And, and people needed jobs, and basketball combined with factory work was, was an ideal location if you had not gone to college or if you had not graduated with a degree. And of course, even if you had, you could work in management. So that Sheboygan and Oshkosh were, were really the, uh, the epitome of, of the places to, that the, the NBL represented. And it meant that these places were, to coin a phrase, big league. And I use that term a lot, that it was a way to be a, a recognized, important city without having all of the problems that places like Chicago and New York might have, that they were small towns in atmosphere, but big cities economically. Yeah, and even winning the uh, entire t- the entire title in uh, 42-43, beating those uh, Pistons that we referenced earlier. Um, but perhaps uh, the sort of the coup de grace on, uh, on that story is um, uh, the fate, I guess, of uh, some of the other smaller market teams, right, that did indeed, once the uh, merger uh, with the BAA and the formation of the NBA in, uh, in August of 1949 occurred, uh, you saw, uh, you know, the, the, those smaller market teams were, um, uh, were part of the mix, which was great, but they didn't last uh, past that first season. Uh, perhaps because of their small marketness, no? Yeah, b- between that and then the farther travel, it just it wasn't going to work uh, once they had the, the greater financial demands and salaries had been driven up. One of the reasons for the for the merger is that salaries had been driven up because of the competition between the BAA and the NBL. Now, relatively speaking, it wasn't a lot of money, but for smaller towns, it was going to be more demanding and for smaller factories. So that uh, over the, the first three years of the NBA, uh, almost all of the NBL teams uh, left the, uh, had to go out of business. And there was really the same, there was not the same kind of uh, a barnstorming that there had been before. But before they went, the NBL pioneered so many things, among which was integrated basketball in the professional ranks. Yeah, I wanted to get to that. Yeah, we, we, that is, let's uh, talk about that now. That's, that's a very, very important point that we've glossed over thus far. Well, the, uh, the, the, two, the first team that was, was most important, the Chicago Studebakers, as I mentioned earlier, were obviously out of the old Studebaker plant that was in Chicago and was working for uh, 
for the war effort in 42-43, and uh, the Studebakers were an integrated team of black and white players, and this had not happened before. And so this was, uh, the NBA didn't become really integrated until uh, the 1950s, and Major League Baseball until 1947, but uh, in 1942-43, the Chicago Studebakers were an integrated team that played in the Midwest. And, uh, and at the end of the year, at the end of the NBL's existence in uh, 1948, another integrated, well, another team, uh, the, the great New York Renaissance team was asked to take over a franchise that had folded in the middle of the season, the Detroit Vagabond Kings, and the uh, the Wrens, which was an, uh, an all-black team, came into the league at that time and were the first all-black team to play in a professional league, mixed, uh, integrated league. So that there was, the, the firsts were both basketball-wise and, and in terms of society. So the NBL has so much to to warrant its inclusion, its teams and its players inclusion in, uh, in the Hall of Fame in so many different ways, but it just hasn't happened as much as it should have. Now, the New York Renaissance are an interesting story, and, and I, 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 uh, I very much look forward to getting deeper into that story specifically because there's, there's much more to it than just their one uh, almost full season in the, uh, the last year of the NBL, but um, you know, also known as uh, the New York Renaissance or the Renaissance Big Five. Uh, the Wrens, um, you know, uh, are arguably uh, as famous, if not more so, uh, during the day and, and in terms of the quality of play as, say, folks like the Harlem Globetrotters, right, in terms of barnstorming and being all Af- African-American. I mean, the, the, the Wrens, you know, really tried to, you know, make their way into whatever level of professional basketball circuits there were uh, up to and including the NBL. And, and in many respects, uh, their their first and last, if you will, chance came when the NBL came a calling uh, to fill in a gap and uh, in some respects almost hastened uh, the demise of the franchise, the Wrens, that is, uh, as the league dissipated uh, after that sort of final season. So kind of ironic that they finally, quote unquote, broke through the Wrens did uh, as a professional circuit uh, playing team, yet, um, you know, only to go down or to be uh, uh, sort of uh, tossed aside as the NBL itself uh uh, burrowed its way into the NBA and, and, and the smaller teams and, and those less fortunate didn't uh, hang on to, to continue. And they, they were not uh, invited into the league. And they probably, it's hard to tell if they would have accepted after the, 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 the half year that they played as the Dayton Wrens because they made so much more by being a barnstorming team. Uh, they were on the road all the time uh, they, they, most of the guys lived in New York, but in that year, they obviously had rooms in rooming houses in Dayton, but they, they traveled all the time and they were superior. And in fact, the first world championship of basketball, of professional basketball was won by the Wrens and some of the great teams. And, and there's another book that, uh, that focuses on uh, the great rivalry between the Wrens and the Lakers, and that that rivalry uh, played itself out uh, at least in the first World Professional Tournament, which the Wrens won. The Globetrotters ended up winning the second one, so it it was kind of uh, an indication that African American players could compete with the great white players, which uh, had to be shown just as it had to be in in baseball, that uh, the color you were was not a reflection of the quality of the play that you could uh, level you could play at. And the the Wrens, starting in New York and then playing in Dayton, and then they basically, as you said, that hastened their end. Uh, Many of the players stopped playing or some ended up playing for the Globetrotters. They played for a few more years and were fabulous players. And uh, I was fortunate enough to be friends with um, 
probably the last one who was alive, Johnny Isaacs. And, and John had some great stories, some, some artifacts, but mostly it was being able to talk with John and being able to, to be around him to find out more about the Wrens. And he visited me here and, uh, we would get together at other times in other places, but, uh, the Wrens were just an incomparable team. They had some, some fabulous players, some of whom are now in, again, through what we might call the, the back door of old timers who are, or trying to get some of the African American players through a different, uh, focal point into the Basketball Hall of Fame. So they have been recognized. Uh, but it was the NBL that gave them prom- more prominence because otherwise they were really only covered in terms of the media in uh, what were black newspapers like the Chicago Defender. Yeah, I, I, again, to me, fascinating story and uh, and one that I'd like to go a lot deeper with. But uh, perhaps in, in um, maybe we could sort of uh, close this particular loop. Um, obviously, based in, uh, in New York and Harlem, um, and they were replacing in the mid- middle of the season or of such in 1949, 48-49, uh, a team in Detroit that went sideways. Why Dayton then? So it wasn't Detroit and wasn't New York. It was Dayton. Any ideas to why the Wrens were plugged in there versus, say, their home in New York and or replacing the team, uh, at least uh, geographically, in Detroit, which is the team that they uh, replaced? Uh, two reasons. Two reasons. One, one was that uh, there was uh, corporate and, and, uh, and local sponsorship that were willing to do this. And the second was that it was convenient in terms of placement for the league. Uh, Dayton, Ohio was, uh, again, right on the railroads. The railroads were one of the keys to the success of, of the NBL. And, and Dayton fit perfectly at that time. I mean, it's hard to believe today how important the railroads were, but they were. Very interesting. All right. So let's uh, let's segue then into sort of, I guess, the denouement, if you will, of of the NBL. And we kind of hinted at uh, perhaps one of the dominant uh, components of the last years of the league. Uh, and that was um, a team known as the Rochester Royals in particular. I'm sorry, uh, my mistake. Uh, the um, uh, the Minneapolis Lakers, right? Uh, George Mikan, uh, in particular, a, a towering figure, no pun or maybe complete pun uh, in uh, not only the NBL, but uh, for uh, what professional basketball looked like in the uh, in the years to come, uh, do you want to talk about the Lakers in particular and uh, and George Mikan uh, and his role and his influence in the latter days of the uh, the NBL and then and then obviously what uh, became of uh, the remnants of that going forward? Well, Mikan changed basketball because he was big and agile. Uh, compared to today's players, he wouldn't be seen as agile, but compared to big players then, he was just quicker, had, had a wonderful touch inside, and he was able to dominate a game. He was 6'10", and there were no players that were 6'10 at that time. There, there, there were a few guys that might have been almost that tall, but they were lumbering oafs, and I don't mean to insult them, but in terms of their play, they were lumbering oafs. Uh, Mikan was fortunate enough to have outstanding coaching when he played it to Paul from Ray Meyer, who taught him footwork. And it was footwork that made Mikan uh, the, the player that he was. And he and, and Dick Tripto played well together and were uh, eager to continue to play well together as they did in, in Chicago. But Mikan ended up uh, playing then for the Lakers once the gears went out of business uh, because they, they could not keep up financially. And Mikan combined uh, initially with, uh, with Bobby McDermott, but ultimately uh, he was playing with, with a, a number of guys who knew how to get him the ball and a great jumping jack of a forward at the time, uh, Jim Pollard. And Pollard was, and the two of them were, were just rebounding machines. And it made a tremendous difference. Uh, the Lakers probably could have continued to dominate, would have dominated the NBL, 
when they went into the NBA, they were the dominant team in the NBA, uh, first in the BAA for the one year, and then for the next few years in the NBA. Uh, the Lakers were just uh, the best team, and they had the best players, and they had uh, they had some great games against the Wrens, who were the other best team, except the Wrens were no longer in a league. And that meant that uh, their their games against the Wrens were, were fewer and farther between. But when they played, which was usually once or twice in a year, uh, the games were memorable. And when they played for the World Championship, uh, in, there used to be a tournament, the World Championship. At the end of the year, there was an invited tournament and had uh, players from all the professional leagues, as well as the armed forces and AAU teams, and they would meet in a uh, uh, a tournament that would determine who was the real professional champion. And the Lakers and the Wrens ultimately ended up being uh, the champions more than anyone else until that that died quickly because leagues didn't like to be embarrassed. So if they weren't going to win it, they didn't want to continue to support it. And uh, after a few years, the World Professional Tournament went out of business. Yeah, and I, I think it's really important as a as a as a marker here in in, a, in our little timeline that um, yeah, the importance of uh, of George Mikan as a player and as a as a dominating figure uh, in the league and in basketball in general cannot be underestimated because you know uh, he was part of the Chicago American Gears uh, and, and helped them win the uh, the title in forty six forty seven and then with the Lakers in forty seven forty eight and it's important to remember right that the BAA the Basketball Association of America which we've been talking about over the over the course of our conversation started in 1946. Right. So here's the BAA with sort of their uh, their bigger uh, aspirations and the big city sort of approach. Uh, and here's Mike and basically leading two different teams uh, into uh, the championship stratus, uh, the strata in um, in those uh, in those early years of the BAA's existence. Um, but maybe this is also an important point. Maybe it's a footnote. And it's an asterisk or whatever. But, you know, that's we love this stuff. Um uh, Mike and uh, didn't uh, immediately go from Chicago one year to Minneapolis the second year. Uh, there was this thing called the uh, the Professional Basketball League of America. I don't know how much uh, you uh, came across this in your. Well, that was that was where the the gears were, and and that league. Uh, Dick talks about this in 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 his book uh, that they chose, uh, and and Dick's book is called the Dynasty that Never Was. Uh, uh, the owners of the of the gears got together with uh, with others and decided that rather than go into the this new NBA stuff or the new BAA, they would they would form their own league when the NBL died, and they would they would have the Professional Basketball League of of America, and that was only in forty seven forty eight, and that was it. Uh, the league lasted a year and it was finished. The Gears won that. The Gears uh, then ended up going out of business and the league went out of business. But it was, uh, there, there wasn't enough interest to support two basketball leagues as the NBL and the, and the BAA found. And when the NBA started, or the BAA started and the NBL was was on its last legs, there wasn't any room for three, and there certainly didn't end up being any room for two either. But the the, the PBLA uh, was really the gears and Mike and dominated there. Yeah, interesting. Um, all right, so perhaps maybe you could give our, our audience a bit of a sense of sort of what was um, what drove uh, what ultimately became, as we said before, in August. August 3rd in particular, 1949, in New York's Empire State Building, the uh, the ultimate uh, merger, if you want to call it that, between uh, the longer standing NBL uh, and its relative small townness but high quality player base and the, I guess, bigger aspirational city mindset of the BAA. Can you give us uh, a sense of perhaps what drove the conversations around putting these two entities together and forming a, a sole uh, National Basketball Association from such? Well, it's as usual, the, the 
driving force was money and that neither team, neither league was making a profit. Um, the BAA had big cities and big venues and the BAA had actually been started only because a hockey league, NHL owners had the rights to the use of the venues in their cities and they wanted to put something in there and they started a basketball league, but it didn't have the players. The top players were in the NBL and they were playing in smaller venues, making less money, but they were in the best league. And as the BAA start to, started to raid the B NBL, prices of uh, salaries went up, but it was not sustainable. And both, uh, and the NBL was snickered into thinking that the BAA had an advantage and they had more money. They might have, but they were losing more. So ultimately, they agreed to a merger. And the merger came out almost totally on the side of the BAA. All of the leading executives were former BAA executives. Uh, and that was, and that was unfortunate, but that was the way it was. Uh, communication was uh, pretty secretive in terms of who made what money. But ultimately, the, uh, the merger seemed to be good for, for the, for the leagues, for, but not for the players, because they were going to have their salaries. You know, if we look at basic supply and demand, all of a sudden there was no more, uh, competition for their, for their contracts. And the NBL, uh, faded, the BAA faded. Yet, as we said when we started this conversation, the BAA or the NBA, which was, uh, formed as a result of that, only used the BAA as its history. The NBL was non-existent. Uh, they wouldn't have called it a, a minor league, a, a semi-pro league. They could use any adjective that they wanted, but it, it wouldn't have been true. They were two upstanding leagues, one with great venues and mediocre players, the other with fantastic players and smaller towns and venues. And made only more complicated when you look at through the uh, the lens of history and 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 halls of fame and statistics and 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 the usage of or the remembrances of or not, um, you know the you know uh, exacerbated right by the the uh, the season prior to this merger actually happening the nineteen forty eight nineteen forty nine season where you had uh, one two three four teams the Lakers Rochester Fort Wayne and the Indianapolis Kautskis. Best name ever. Yes. Well, named after Frank Kautsky, the who owned the grocery store. A there you go. Chain. There you go. So uh, and then some of the names of these teams are just uh, tremendous. You, you know, you can't you can't uh, you can't make some of them up. Uh, perhaps I think, by the way, my fa uh, my favorite was the uh, Jim White Chevrolets of Toledo. Very catchy. Yeah. Which then became, of course, the Jim White Jeeps. Uh, in 46, yeah. right. Which um, do you wonder why those names did change? But um, my, my favorite has always been the, the non skids, though, for a basketball team. Sure, not skids. Why it, 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 you couldn't uh, you couldn't have a better uh, promotion for it. rubber, both in the soles of the uh, of the tires being made, as well as the uh, the sneakers making the noise uh, on the court. But and, and the picture of a guy on the floor, not <laughs> skidding, not skidding, even better. Um, but it just it just seems to be exacerbated by the fact you had those teams bolt for the BAA prior to the the BAA actually kind of uh, maybe. Uh, not so even handedly uh, uh, forcing uh, so, sort of the merger. But but I thought I maybe I picked up what you just said, that it was the hockey arena owners that were kind of the 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 uh, strings, perhaps behind the BAA and uh, more aspirational, even though they didn't have as much of the talent, say, as the NBL. Yeah, oh, exactly. Yeah, they were looking to fill their arenas because they had the rights to them and they were paying for them. So the more they could fill them, uh, the more they would be able to get. Otherwise, they'd sit empty. And you don't make any money when you've got the rights to an arena and it's sitting empty. So it seemed like a, a logical way for them to, to find something that would fill the arenas on a regular basis, and that became the BAA. All right, so two, two uh, final points to sort of uh, uh, maybe uh, tie up some loose ends here. So um, when we talk about the records and the statistics, and we've said that before that the NBA uh, uh, does not – uh, officially recognize uh, uh, the NBL statistics, but it does recognize the BAAs. Uh, is there any opportunity to reopen that uh, conversation, that investigation, or has that door essentially been shut uh, in terms of of keeping the NBL uh, 
uh, and getting their statistics and, and whatnot sort of uh, fully into the mix of, of, of uh, historical uh, lineage um, or, uh, you know, I'm not an historian by trade, right? But uh, I suspect that this is uh, an issue within the uh, within the fraternity that uh, perhaps is still alive or is, is it not anymore? Well, it, it depends on on whose recognition you want. Uh, the the Hall of Fame, the Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame has all that data and and looks at it in that context. The the frustrating thing to me is that, as I said earlier, the old timers aren't that old and they've they've neglected now and it's going to be hard. I've uh, headed a campaign uh, to try and get uh, Edwards into the Hall of Fame because Leroy was that good. But I don't think we're going to see the NBA change that much. I don't see the NBA deciding that they're going to be inclusive of saying that records from the NBA will now be seen as part of the NBA. It's, it provides no advantage as far as they're concerned. And uh, I think some of them may think, some of the owners may think it diminishes their history because it makes them look smaller, which they are. But uh, that's my old cynical approach. And uh, from what you can uh, tell, how about uh, we mentioned before some of those uh, those five direct uh, uh, team descendants of, uh, you know, the Lakers and the, and the Kings, et cetera. Have there any any of those franchises been uh, especially good or uh, unique in their uh, uh, their memories or throwbacks of such? Or they've been pretty much commandeered by the NBA in terms of uh, their uh you know, I guess their memories. The Lakers have been the best, but the Lakers were a later franchise anyway. But they recognize why a team like that's located in Los Angeles would have a strange name like the Lakers anyway, because Los Angeles is not exactly known for its lakes. Of course not. No. Uh, no, nor Utah so, with jazz, so to speak, right? No, no, they, they, they do not have that association. But the Lakers have probably been the best. Uh, the, the thing that keeps most of this alive, thankfully, are good sports writers, journalists who have investigated and know and treat the history of these franchises in that manner. So we have the Sacramento Kings going back through being the Kansas City Omaha Kings and being the Cincinnati Royals before that and back to the Rochester Royals. And those franchises recognize their own history and accept it in that manner. Now, I don't know how much they accept the NBL part of it, though, because I have not investigated how much they tout that. But since these teams went into the NBA, uh, they do trace them back to that. Before that, which, it's hard to tell which part of their history they stop or begin at, because I haven't really asked, do you recognize uh, the the Rochester franchise of the NBL. It's it's not a pursuit I've made. Yeah, see, to the casual sports fan, right, this seems like, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, ephemera, right? But um, it, it's it's absolutely not, right? And, you know, when you have, in this case, I, we, I could make some, I, I could probably be convinced, you know, in some of the other teams and leagues and sports that we've, we've discussed and, and will discuss in the in the months ahead, uh, you know, where it, it, the, the link w- it was or it could be a bit more sort of shaky or specious. Right. But th- it's undeniable. No, no, exactly. Yeah. And 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 the, and the idea that, um, you know, these can't be sort of brought back into the into the fold as part of uh, overall history. Look, I mean, 15 players uh, that played in the NBL. Right. Are in the Naismith uh, uh, Basketball Hall of Fame. Uh, that's. You know, and five teams with direct lineages. I mean, that, hard to believe that you can't uh, incorporate uh, what the NBL was and did. And even if it was sort of a bit more um, rustic and small town and whatnot, I mean, that, that's part of flavor of history uh, that, uh, that you know, the today's NBA wouldn't be around had much of that not happened. No, precisely. And it was uh, surprising to me when... I saw that there was no recognition of that. I didn't originally intend to write a book on the NBL, but there wasn't any. And I, most of the basketball books I've written have been based on things that I wanted to know more about. And I figured I wasn't the only person that did. And so I ended up having the interest and the, and the 
uh, I don't want to say at the time, I made the time to pursue the research to, to put these books together. Well, I, th- I for one think it's great, and uh, and I'm glad we're able to ha- get together for yet a- a- another chat. And I think, frankly, people who live uh, today uh, in Sheboygan, uh, Wisconsin, and Anderson, Indiana, and Waterloo, Iowa, three of the teams that uh, did last for one year in that first NBA, uh, you know, will probably be uh, most interested in uh, uh, tying that history uh, back and, and, and clearly remembering that uh, a bit more deeply. But um, so, Murray Nelson, your book is uh, it's called The National Basketball League, A History. 1935 to 1949. It is uh, available wherever good books are sold, including on Kindle. So if you want to get it electronically, yeah. um, what else are you? Uh, we've obviously talked about the ABL and Abe Saperstein. Uh, what else are you working on uh, that uh, perhaps our audience might be interested in, professional or otherwise? Well, the uh, I had a book come out in in January of this year on Big Ten basketball from 1943 to 1972, and and that also uh, the pleasure of being interviewing, being able to interview some of these former players and coaches was uh, wonderful for me. And it got into the times when I actually saw some of these players starting when I was in high school in the 1960s. Uh, and now I'm doing a sequel to that. I don't know how long it'll take. I don't know if I'll finish, but it, the intention is to do Big Ten basketball history from 1973 to ni- to 2000 and include both men and women and I'm co-authoring that with uh, a colleague from uh, Cal State uh Sacramento who's focusing on the women's part and we do- we haven't figured out how we're integrating it but we're working on it now and we hope in the next 2 or 3 years we'll be done any chance that the uh Big 10 television network could be part of those uh those proceedings and perhaps getting a video and or documentary type stuff as well as the writing? Uh, It's certainly possible. I have not contacted anybody in that regard until I've done research that I'm satisfied with. I I don't want to to say, let's do this and then not have answers. So I've had great cooperation from uh, various athletic directors or athletic department offices at uh, at eight of the 10 Big Ten universities, I'm not going to mention the two that I didn't get the same kind of cooperation, but I did get stuff <laughs> uh, in, in finding interviews and getting photos. And ultimately, I would like to see something covered on the Big Ten network, but uh, that's a matter of getting somebody to say, we'll do this. All right. So th- there it is. And our, our audience is uh, uh I don't know how vast it is, but it's very interesting how it uh, gets into various nooks and crannies of people who uh, actually have some uh, some sway in various places. So, number one, with the NBA and and uh, the historians and how we uh, remember uh, the NBL, I think that's certainly uh, uh, item number one. But item number two, anybody who works, uh, say, here in the Chicago area or is, or is working uh, in partnership with or part of the management of Big Ten Network, uh, it sounds to me like you've got a uh, an historian who uh uh, in Murray Nelson, who can be uh, very helpful in uh, further documenting and uh, perhaps pro- helping in the programming of the uh, the origins and the history of uh, of the basketball uh, uh, contributions of the Big Ten. Uh, so hopefully our audience can. Uh, and obviously, if if you uh, if fit any of these two categories, uh, just go to our website, goodseatsstillavailable.com. You'll be able to reach me and I'm happy to put you in touch with uh, with Murray. But in the meantime, Go buy some of his books. Will you uh, prove that our, our our little show actually has some promotional value? And uh, and we thank you for uh, Murray for for being part of it yet again. And I look forward to hopefully a couple more opportunities uh, if and when we can do so. Well, thank you, Tim. Thank you for uh, the the show of support and thank you for the discussion. It's always a pleasure. See, there you go. Very interesting stuff. It, it always is in these uh, these chats. I, I always learn something. And, and frankly, I hope our, uh, you out there in the listener land uh, are as well. We didn't even get to uh, scratch the surface on some of these uh, stories. I, you know, the, some of the some of the team names are just uh, uh, just uh, all around uh, terrific. And you can imagine what went into um, uh, the naming of these teams and, and some of the marketing that went around them. But uh you know, in, uh, in Toledo, as we said before, the Jim White Chevrolets uh, from 41 to 43. And then, of course, they were known as the Jim White Jeeps from 46 to 48. 
Um, you know, the Richmond King Clothiers uh, must have been something. Uh, the uh, Columbus Athletic Supply in Ohio. Yes, the team that lasted from uh, the 1937 to 38 season. The Cincinnati Camellos. Uh, and, uh, of course, the Anderson Duffy Packers, uh, just to name a few. Uh, uh, some great names, some great stories, certainly some great players. Uh, and I think a bit of injustice, I think, don't you believe, uh, that uh, uh, some some stronger and more official recognition uh, by uh, the NBA, uh, the uh, Naismith Basketball Hall of Fame, uh, and all the sort of professional entities that control uh, professional basketball today uh, uh, owe it to themselves, and I think the fans, and frankly, some of these towns and cities uh, to uh, more deeply and uh, robustly remember and commemorate uh, the uh, the National Basketball League and the uh, contributions of of the teams, the players, the coaches, the owners, and all of the folks uh, involved back in the uh, one of the earliest tributaries to what is today's modern day NBA, National Basketball Association. So if you're listening out there in uh, NBA land, if you have any pull with the Hall of Fame, and of course on the Big Ten front, as you heard Murray uh, talk about his, uh, his current work, um, you know, Murray Nelson is the guy. And uh, if you're not uh, already connected to him or you want to learn more, just get in touch with me here at the show. And I'm more than happy to connect you uh, uh, in that process. Uh, the place, of course, to connect with me and our show and the best place to do so is our website, which is GoodSeatsStillAvailable.com. Make sure you spell it all correctly. GoodSeatsStillAvailable.com. That's where you find all the old episodes. Uh, you will find all the links to where to listen to the show. You will see links to the various books and movies and, and other items. Uh, that we've referenced here uh, for purchase or for follow-up. Uh, you will see uh, various photos and uh, all kinds of other sort of uh, uh, ephemera uh, attached to our conversations uh, as uh, as well. On social media, of course, you can follow us uh, on Twitter at Good Seats Still. Uh, you can find us on Instagram at Good Seats Still Available. Uh, there you can like us on uh, Facebook, uh, all of those good things. And uh, we, of course, want to thank uh, the good things that come out of our friends at Podfly Productions, namely the production of this here little show, uh, podfly.net. Uh, the folks there, Eric Begay, uh, Corey Coates, uh, David Gregerson, Jerry Payne, uh, and all the good folks there at Podfly Productions. If you need some help, uh, just even getting started with the idea of podcasting, Podfly is the place to go. I highly recommend them. Uh, tell them that uh, Tim Hanlon and the and or the Good Seat Still Available show sent you, and they're at Podfly. Net. Okay, so thanks very much for listening. Uh, we appreciate uh, you doing so. Uh, please tell your friends. Please rate and review us where you can. And uh, we love the love you send us. And uh, please keep sending it our way. We uh, are encouraged and enthused by when you do so. And uh, it gives us uh, sustenance, if you will, to uh, continue to do what we're doing. And we appreciate your cards and letters and suggestions. Uh, until next week, we'll, uh, we'll talk to you soon. And uh, thank, again, thank you again for listening. Uh, take care, everybody. Bye-bye. 